Yeah, so hi, uh, I'm Andrea, and today I have the pleasure of presenting our paper, Practical EMV Relay Protections. So, let's just get started. EMV, it stands for European MasterCard and Visa. Now, what it is, is basically a bunch of standards that define how a payment card communicates with a payment terminal. And interestingly, each payment network has a slightly different protocol. So here you can see MasterCards and, and Visas. And as you can see, they are fairly complex protocols. And I don't really think that anyone's going to like disagree with me when I say that contactless payments are increasing, increasingly popular. You know, they're widely used in, in Europe, and we also see a shift uh, towards using them in the US too. And that is why it's important that we look at their security. So, now we've already seen research that demonstrates that relaying a transaction, yes, from a contactless card um, is possible. So Tom over there actually performed this cross-Atlantic New York to Birmingham relay attack about seven years ago. So this is all like kind of old news, right? But what about uh, mobile payments? In order to pay with your phone, you have to unlock it first, right? That means relays aren't possible. Well, both Visa and, and MasterCard are aware of relays as an issue and have each proposed their own relay protections. And we're going to discuss each of the, their proposals in, in a bit. But right now, let's focus on payments with phones, mobile payments. The user authentication requirement should be a relay protection in its own, right? Well, introducing Apple Pay Express Travel, because when you are on the London Underground, you really don't want to be causing queues at the gates. So Express Travel allows you to basically pay on transport systems without requiring user authentication. It's just tap and go, streamline, downgrading security. Okay, so to actually understand uh, how Express Travel works, uh, myself and then Iwana took trips, quite a lot of trips on the London Underground. And while tapping in and out of the network, I sniffed the communication between the iPhone and the barrier reader with a Proxmark, which is basically the Swiss army knife of RFID. Now, I have to mention here that Tom was utterly terrified that I'm going to like, be caught by someone and interrogated. Uh, but you know, there's no greater ally than you know, one trusted handbag to just hide all of your equipment. So this is what we would expect to see in, in one of these, okay, traces. This is the ISO 1443A activation and anti-collision uh, protocol that selects a card. And this is the TFL trace. And we can actually see here an extra message, right? Okay, so from our initial investigation, we found that these magic bytes unlock Apple Pay, but there are also some more conditions that need to be satisfied. We found out that the merchant category code needs to be transit related but there is a little caveat for Visa, uh, which I'm going to touch upon in a bit. We also found out that the re reader needs to support offline data uh, authentication for online authorizations. And this is a feature that's typical for, for transit readers, for readers who have like intermittent connectivity. So that's for Apple Pay. We also looked at Samsung Pay, and we actually figured out that it works quite differently. It doesn't need these magic bytes. The phone will start an EMV transaction uh, even if it's locked. However, if the amount of the transaction is greater than zero, the phone just replies with an error code and just stops the transaction. Okay, so having acquired all of this information, we needed to, to make sense of it. And therefore, we modeled it using Tamarind. We extended the formal uh, models of Basin et al., which were designed for card payments, and we created new uh, models for mobile payments. 
The formal models allowed us to, to confirm an attack which was sort of emerging from our practical experiments. And this is how it works. So at a high level, in our attack setup, we have an iPhone which has a Visa card set up as a travel card. Then we have a Proxmark which acts as a terminal emulator. We also use an NFC-enabled Android phone that runs an application that we wrote wrote, which is, acts as a card emulator, and this will just communicate with a genuine, uncompromised EMV reader. Think of it you are like your shop reader. Okay. The Proxmark starts off by sending these magic bytes to, to the iPhone, and we actually later found out that these magic bytes are uh, part of something called Apple Enhanced Contactless Polling, Ask me later if you want to know. Um, then the normal 14A activation protocol just runs. And now we can start relaying EMV messages. Now, for the important bits, quite literally bits, in this attack, in order to perform it, we need to flip a bit in the terminal transaction qualifier, which allows us to pretend to the iPhone that it's talking to a transit reader, right? So this bit is the ODA for online authorizations bit that I just mentioned earlier. Then, if we want to perform uh, an over the limit, contact, over the contactless limit transaction, we also need to flip a bit in the card transaction qualifier. And this allows us to pretend to the EMV reader that on device user authentication has already been performed even though it hasn't been. And also the card um, authentication related data down there, card, uh, contains a copy of the CTQ. So we actually need to flip the same bit in that as well. Now, interestingly, the signed dynamic application data, the SDAD, includes the card um, authentication related data, the value we just modified. So if the EMV reader would check it, it would be able to, to detect the over the limit attack. But because the EMV reader is performing an online transaction, it doesn't actually need the SDAD. And even though it receives it, it doesn't bother checking it. Moreover, the issuer application data encodes basically whether on-device uh, user authentication has been performed. So cross-referencing this with the amount, for example, of the transaction would allow Visa to detect this attack. But sadly, this isn't checked either. Okay, so let's have a look at the attack in practice. So we have there an iPhone 7. We also verified it with a 12, iPhone 12. Underneath it, we have a, a Proxmark, as I said, the terminal uh, emulator, and you'll see in a second that the iPhone is locked. Yeah, up there. Next, we set up our transaction on the SumUp Reader app. We're going bid money, a thousand pounds. And then we are going to, to start our replay and relay script. That's the Android phone that we use as a card emulator that we're playing with. And we've paid. So you're going to see in, in a few seconds that the uh, iPhone is actually still locked. So this means that, for example, a stolen iPhone that's locked could be um, used to, to um, deplete someone's account with this method. Now, I mentioned a couple of slides ago this, this merchant category code. For Visa, the MCC is actually sent from the EMV reader to the bank, but it's never sent to the phone. If the phone was sent the MCC code, it would be able to detect that it's actually paying a shop uh, reader rather than a transit reader. Or Visa or the bank could cross-reference the MCC with the IAD and, and just detect the over-the-limit payment. 
So you can kind of see here that there are quite a lot of missed opportunities for, for these attacks to be caught. We've obviously re, uh, re disclosed this to both Apple and, and Visa, and it was all, all a bit of a car crash. So summary is Apple and Visa are blaming each other and the vulnerability is still live. Yeah. So regarding other combinations of mobile payments and, and network providers, so MasterCard actually sends the merchant category code to the phone and it properly authenticates the transaction data, including the MCC. So that means we can't change it. And therefore Apple Pay with MasterCard are, are just fine. Samsung Pay, as I said, it only uses uh, zero value transactions in, in transit mode. So even Visa with, with Samsung Pay, that works fine. It can't be exploited. Now, Google Pay allows transactions under the contactless limit without user authentication by design. That's fair point. But we did confirm that a three-year-old attack, which basically performs an over-the-limit uh, transaction, still works today on a Pixel 5. Okay, so let's go on to Visa's relay protection. So the idea of Visa's uh, protocol is to defend against relays with off-the-shelf devices such as the mobile phones I've been using. The selection of a card is done usually in mobile phones by the firmware and it's not um, accessible in user mode. So Visa uses the unique identifier of a card as a random number. It does the transaction and then at the end, it includes the uh, UID in the sign dynamic application data. How can we relate this? Well, we take an NFC enabled phone, which is gonna act as a terminal emulator. This phone is going to ask our card, what's your UID? The card is going to answer, and we're gonna take that and forward it to a rooted Android phone that's going to act as a card emulator. Now the root is important because uh, it allows for um, the, the card emulator phone to set its own UID. So when the terminal asks it, what's your UID? It just responds with a stolen value. Then we just relay the transaction uh, data. And we also relay the SDAD, which will have a perfectly correct UID in it. And the terminal is happy, so job done. Okay, so MasterCard's relay protections. MasterCard uses a timed nonce exchange at application layer. And actually, previous papers formally modeled and, and looked at this protocol and, and looked at the protocol's timing, and they considered it secure. But what they didn't consider is the, the variation of the card in the field, which is you know, how cards get powered. So we ran an experiment to see the response times under different distances and angles. And what we found is that while, while the angle does somewhat influence the response time, you can clearly see that the further the card is from a reader, the longer it takes for the response from that card to be received by the reader. And the difference is significant enough that you could actually perform a relay attack in this gap. And I should be said at this point that, that um, we used uh, a test card in our experiment because there are no commercially available uh, cards that actually implement MasterCard relay resistant protocol yet. But we did talk to, to MasterCard and they, they accepted our findings and uh, they said they will improve the implementation of their protocol in the future. Okay, so having all this information, we thought, you know, how can we improve relay resistance in contactless cards? So we ran some more experiments and it turns out that response times at the card activation and anti-collision level are much shorter and have a lot less variation than at application level. 
So taking this knowledge, we present our um, new protocol, our L1RP, which uses a strict timing none um, within the card selection procedure, and it binds that at application level. It has separate relay resistance and payment proofs, so that makes the protocol backwards compatible, and it also allows us to have uh, clear security proofs. And also, downgrade attacks are prevented by cross-checking um, authenticated flags, which are, again, included both at, at card selection uh, level and at application level. And you, know, you don't have to believe me that our protocol is, is secure. Uh, we actually formally modeled it and proved its security. So, so check this out in, in the paper. And as I said, we also created uh, models for the mobile versions of Visa and MasterCard, and we also verified uh, both of our attacks. So that's it for me. All our artifacts are actually available on our GitHub page, so feel free to check them out, and thank you. Questions? Hi, this is Paul from Max Planck again. Um, how does your work relate to classical distance bounding where you try to verify proximity on a challenge response protocol? Or is that an, a variant of a distance bounding protocol, I'd say? I think it's, it's a variant, basically. Yeah. It's very related to it because you time the response time, which is definitely what you do in distance bounding. Yeah. Um, have you um, investigated um, like the time resolution that you can uh, achieve on the application uh, level, because like timers are often inaccurate and uh, may only give very coarse um, resolution. It's a very good question. No. <laughs> okay. um, and final question: yeah. like, Have you tested the maximum response time which the terminals um, uh, have before like issuing a timeout? So. That is, again, a very good question. So um, according to the EMV standard, a terminal should time out at 500 milliseconds. Oh, wow. That's quite which a is, lot. Yeah, <laughs> quite a lot. I will admit we haven't actually tested to see if it will wait that long. Just that's quite a big value. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome. So we have time for one more quick question. So, Alyssa Milburn, Intel, I saw in your paper that kind of Apple Pay supports a whole bunch of different um, transport systems. So I'm just wondering, does this attack work on all of them? That is a very good question. We tested it on, um, so, okay, let me backtrack. So the magic part of it is that you have these like magic bytes that basically unlock Apple Pay, and then it just runs a normal transaction. So as long as you have the correct magic bytes, it should just work, because the pro DMV protocol itself will just be the same. Uh, but I can, I can confirm that different transport uh, systems have different magic bytes. So the one I showed there was from TFL, but then we also went and took some traces from some buses that recently introduced it. And we saw there are slight differences. But yes, technically, if you have magic bytes from other transport systems, you should just be able to, to use that. Okay, no, that's terrifying, but thank you yeah. very much. Great talk. Thank you. Okay, why don't we thank uh, Andrea.